This is the story of Silicon Valley. I'm your host, Leonard Nimoy. It was the gold rush of 1849 that really opened up California to the world. Gold miners made and lost riches within a few years. But the merchants that supplied the miners were the ones who earned the enduring wealth. The origin of Silicon Valley's focus on technology goes back to the founding of Stanford University. A consummate entrepreneur, Leland Stanford, who made his first fortune selling picks and shovels to gold miners, then risked it all again to build the Central Pacific Railroad, connecting California with the East Coast. Stanford later became California's Civil War governor and one of the largest landowners in the state. When his only child, Leland Stanford Jr., died, he and his wife, Jane Lathrop, decided to devote their entire fortune towards the building of a great university, a place of learning that would strive to teach practical knowledge. In Stanford University's early years, tuition was free. As the university prospered, its students and faculty often engaged in entrepreneurial endeavors. Many of these were connected to advances in technology. Stanford is probably the reason the Valley is here. And I think Stanford and their uh, open and lenient policies with regard to company formation, especially as encouraged by Terman in the early days, and it led to a style, which I think is, is why the Valley is what it is. Fred Terman developed the premier electrical engineering department in the world. And then when he came into the dean of the engineering office, undertook to make the School of Engineering one of the premier schools in the world. In the course of doing that, encouraged his own students, Hewlett and Packard, to develop companies. Well, I was always interested in science and uh, uh, electrical engineering, electrical things way back when I was 10, 11, 12 years old. And it was sort of natural to uh, at least uh, get interested, uh, and see what, what all this wireless telegraph was about. Um, and I built a set, a receiving set, in 19, around 1913, never having seen a set myself, except as pictures in a magazine. And I built a set, and uh, just as happened, uh, got it all together and fiddled around and played with it. Uh, and uh, within 10 minutes, I heard a signal. If I had not heard a signal and that something had been wrong and uh, worked on this for two or three days and got nothing, probably my career would have been quite different. Here it sounds like. See, it produces a variable tone. And that's just part of, part of the range, uh, so we thought a great deal about this and finally decided we'd go ahead and try and build these units. Two Stanford University graduates, Bill Hewlett and David Packard, formed Hewlett Packard in 1939. One of HP's first products was an audio oscillator sold to Walt Disney for the making of the film Fantasia. So, Fred Terman and Bill Ray had a, Bill and I had a Sort of a game. He'd invite these people out to tell them uh, what a great place this is going to be. Then he'd send them over to see us, and we'd back him up with that. So it was kind of one two punch that we <laughs> worked on these fellows to uh, bring their establishment out here. And uh, as you know, that was very successful because uh, we've attracted uh, at that time some of the most important uh, companies in the country to establish their headquarters here. The Silicon Valley has had a tradition, uh, starting with Hewlett and Packard, etc., of building fundamentally new technologies in close alignment with the research going on at the universities. And so you have a sense of business, technology, and university research coming very you know, close together and finding the right kind of a marriage. Today, Hewlett Packard is a worldwide company primarily in the computer and printing business. During World War II, brothers Sigurd and Russell Varian developed the top secret Klystron tube in a lab at Stanford University. This device was small enough to install on England's fighter planes and was the critical device in locating and destroying enemy Nazi U-boats in the Atlantic. 
With over 90% of the U-boats destroyed, American troops and supplies could be transported to England for the D-Day invasion. Sig and Ross Varian formed Varian Associates in 1948. In the 1950s, Silicon Valley benefited from convergences of Stanford University's entrepreneurial policies, the successful examples set by Hewlett Packard and the Varian brothers, plus the beautiful climate. In 1956, Nobel laureate William Shockley would bring to Silicon Valley the transistor and a team of the brightest young minds in electronics. Eight of these brilliant young men left Shockley to start Fairchild Semiconductor. Shockley called these former employees the traitorous eight. Fairchild was really the first major uh, fountain of all of this technology growth and, and, and invention. The only semiconductor uh, company that was here uh, prior to Fairchild, uh, any, any great uh, moment was Shockley Laboratories. Someone suggested we should talk to Bill Shockley because he has great insight into this kind of thing. So uh, the meeting was arranged and Bernie and I went over there and uh, we met with Shockley and Bernie described to him what we were doing. And then Shockley asked a question like, does some phenomena happen in, at this point? And, and Bernie Widrow said, well, why would you expect that to happen? And Shockley looked at him and said, because Mother Nature's a bitch. <laughs> 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 well, it's one way to look at it. It's my own experience that to uh, do creative work, one must overextend oneself, one must count on falling on his face, on getting into difficulties. One must learn from these failures and not be stopped by them. But, one, uh, but if one is taught that everything is neat and orderly, and one never gets into a mess when trying to do anything new, then he will be so conservative that I don't think he'll break new ground. I think the big contribution that can be made uh, maybe the biggest educational contribution that could be made to the creativity of people is to uh, persuade them that they shouldn't worry about making mistakes. This will be inevitable. With Fairchild Semiconductor and its hundreds of spin-offs, sometimes called Fair Children, the convergence in Silicon Valley was now driven by a new cutting-edge technology, semiconductors aided by the arrival of venture capital. In 1968, Two of the traitorous eight, Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore, joined another Fairchild star, Andy Grove, and formed Intel. Intel soon became the industry leader in semiconductors. Intel was a company which was really a collection of the finest brains and technology that existed at Fairchild. Intel's values come from Fairchild. Some of them are a reaction to things we didn't like at Fairchild. You know, a lot of us loved working at Fairchild and hated working at Fairchild at the same time. And almost automatically, the way Intel developed this, we transported those aspects that we loved and with a vengeance worked against those things that we disliked. I went to Fairchild in 1966. Um, and that was where I first met Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore and Andy Grove and uh, some of those people. It is part of the characteristic of Silicon Valley and change and rapid innovation and organizations and companies trying to cope with that rapid change. And I think it's part of the fun of, of this place. By the 1970s, the convergence of high technology included thousands of startups, a venture capital industry, and the arrival of the microprocessor. Some people have asked whether we thought the microprocessor was an important product. And I have a tear sheet from the first ad we placed. This ad stated that we were announcing a new era of integrated electronics, a microprogrammable computer on a chip. So the thing I always say about Silicon Valley is, uh, in the Midwest, maybe today it's changed, but when I was there, they would, if you had an idea, they want to know, well, where, where else has it been done? Silicon Valley is just the opposite. 
it isn't a place where you have to prove there's, an, there's something that's been done in order to get somebody's attention. That's a huge jump, at least was for me. Lots of people start companies and start interesting and successful companies. And there's so many role models and so many examples of people doing that around you that it begins to get an air of normalcy. And even though it's risky as, as can be, somehow it just seems normal out here to take that risk. Steve Wozniak, student, came up with this idea. You could shrink everything onto one board. This was in the late 70s. Suddenly, all the old companies, IBM, Sperry, Burroughs, Digital Equipment Corporation, Data General, all those companies, saw these new tiny companies springing up, the single board companies. Now, that's why we started Apple. We said, you know, we have absolutely nothing to lose. I was 20 years old at the time. Woz was 24 or 5. So we, we have nothing to lose. I mean, we have no families, no children, uh, no houses. Woz had an old car. You know, I had a Volkswagen van. I mean, all, all we were going to lose is the, the, our cars and the shirts off our back. We had nothing to lose, and we had everything to gain. And we figured, even if we crash and burn and lose everything, the experience will have been worth 10 times the cost. In 1982, when these microprocessors became available, a whole new set of companies that no one had ever heard of started. Apple had been going for about seven years or so, by then, six or seven years, making single board computers. The rest of us built them. So Apple, Sun, Intel was nowhere a tiny company until the sudden rise in these kinds of chips. Microsoft, never heard of Microsoft. There were, there were discussions about the possibility of home computers fairly early on. And I'll have to admit, I was a skeptic, because usually somebody was saying that this computer will tell the housewife what to cook for dinner, and I'd say her husband can't tell her what to cook for dinner. Why is she going to pay attention to a computer? Where I first saw the personal computers being used were by some of our marketing people. They got themselves Apple computers and started using them in some of their marketing applications, where they use I guess, spreadsheet type programs or, or use them for helping to put together presentations. And uh, that seemed to be a, a more, more likely application. We came up with a very elegant solution that was not thought possible at that time. That enabled the printing solution to solve all kinds of problems. And that plus the focus on an open architecture and an open standard and opening it up rather than keeping it proprietary caused the early success of desktop publishing uh, and, and really ultimately changed the whole world of printing and publishing. One of the things that Waz and I did was we built blue boxes. Uh, these are obsolete now, but uh, they were devices that you could build. You know, when you make a long distance phone call in the background, you do 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 do. Those are the telephone computers actually signaling each other, sending information to each other to set up your call. And the signaling they use is a lot like touch-tone phones, only it's different frequencies. Well, you can make a box that emits those frequencies, that can make those tones. And there's a way to, there used to be a way to fool the entire telephone system into thinking you were a telephone computer and to open up itself and let you call anywhere in the world for free. And matter of fact, you could go to, you could, you know, call from a, a pay phone, uh, go to White Plains, New York, take a satellite to Europe, take a cable to Turkey, uh, come back to Los Angeles, uh, and you go around the world three or four times and call the pay phone next door and shout in the phone, and be about 30 seconds and come out the other end of the, the other phone. So we actually, and these were illegal, I, I have to add, uh, but in spite of that, we were so fascinated by them that Waz and I actually figured out how to build one. We built the best one in the world. It was the first digital blue box in the world. And uh, we would uh, give them to our friends and use them ourselves. And You know, you, you rapidly run out of people you want to call. But it was, the, it was the magic of the fact that two teenagers could build this box for $100 worth of parts and control hundreds of billions of dollars of infrastructure in the entire telephone network in the whole world from Los Altos in Cupertino, California. That was magical. And experiences like that taught us the power of ideas, the power of understanding that if you could build this box, you can control 
hundreds of millions of dollars worth of telephone infrastructure around the world. That, that's a powerful thing. And, and that, if we hadn't have made blue boxes, we, there would have been no Apple. Every two weeks, we had a meeting at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center on Wednesday nights, and boy, that was the most important day of my life. The rest of the two weeks was almost all my spare time was spent planning and writing some software to show up and planning for this event, the Homebrew Computer Club, and go down there, and as shy as I was, and I'd never raise my hand and say anything, there was a period where we could show off something we have, and I would set up my computer with my Sears Color TV, and people would come up and ask questions, and I could answer them. I can remember Steve Jobs asking me whether I wanted to help him fund Apple Computer, offering me a third for $50,000, and I turned him down. Uh, so that's kind of one that got away. A couple of guys with no money didn't really have the, the capital to build the sort of computer that was going to sell zillions into all the homes, build a thousand a month. We didn't have the money either. But St Steve again went out and started, you know, looking for people who would put money into something that could go. We went and talked to the venture capitalists, and uh, none of them would, would give us any money. One of them referred to me as a renegade from the human race, because <laughs> I, I uh, had longer hair then. And, uh, you know, none of them would give us any money, thank God, because then they would have ended up owning most of our company. So, um, yeah, I, I think that, that Apple and a few other companies were good examples to, to the venture capitalists, that great ideas are not the exclusive providence of people with gray hair. And when I saw what Waz had done, um, I said, you know what? This, this particular configuration of things could be the beginning of that. Um, and a lot of people don't appreciate how much technology was in the original Apple design. It was the world's first single board computer, the whole computer on one board. It was the first computer in the world that had RAM on the main circuit board it was the first computer that had a programming language built in in ROM. Um, it was the first computer that interacted seamlessly with an NTSC television set. <laughs> it was the world's first computer that had color graphics, um, or any graphics for that matter. All the other computers. If you wanted to do something graphical, you, you did X, 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 make a circle. Mike Markla put together the whole company. He brought in people he'd been associated with in the past that um, he knew as, you know, he respected their thinking and their, their intelligence, their brains, the, what they could contribute to the company. He brought in people like Art Rock. He put together uh, key people like the right president for our startup years. He, he brought in uh, other key personnel. He really organized the company and uh, organized the company, hired the right people, contributed the capital. He knew where we were going. He was the only one who said, hey, in a few years, we're gonna be a $500 million company. He really was the business brains of Apple and guided our success. And he didn't get that much credit because it was real neat in the popular media to express this idea of two kids coming from nowhere, rags to riches, um, you know, and overturning the world with a new type of product. I felt that we had the opportunity to build a Fortune 500 company in less than five years, which had never been done in the history of American business, to uh, really change in a very positive way the way people live and do things. Well, the actual amount that was spent was $142,000. I had committed to uh, a number higher than that um, if it was needed, but we expected that's what was needed, and that's how much it took. Um, we started the company in uh, early 1977, and by September of 78, uh, or by September of 77, we had net retained earnings. We, we used some pretty unconventional techniques, though. So, we uh, offered the Apple II for sale cash in advance. So <laughs> our, our first customers would pay us first, and then we'd go buy the parts and build, build a machine and, and ship it. Today, you can buy processing power that people would have fought wars over a few decades ago. And you've got that on every student's desk. The personal computer industry was really quite different from Intel in that the personal computer industry really began as a countercultural movement. Uh, it, it, you know, the first uh, people were um, sort of um, 
uh, you know, they were the, the long hair uh, software developers or, or, or hobbyists in the computer industry, and they really distinguished themselves from uh, being uh, part of the mainframe world that was dominating the computer industry. So that in the mainframe world, the big brother world, the centralized computing world, the personal computer was, represented the individual, the freedom of the individual. And so the design and the development of Apple was uh, lightweight personal computing came out of the, in, in, in dis contradistinction to the mainframe, which was impersonal. Uh, the Apple colorful logo was distinguished uh, between the sort of the stark black and white IBM logo. And so everything that was in the computing world prior to the personal computer industry was big and massive centralized control of an organization, control of the individual. The personal computer industry was this countercultural movement that came out of the 60s. Youngsters, many of them with two years experience, but that's better than somebody with two years experience ten times. Uh, in other words, you didn't have any of those uh, impediments to growth that happened with large bureaucratic organizations. It was the startup that was the primordial, prototypical startup in every respect. And more importantly, it was informed with true evangelism, a true sense of mission. In other words, really changing the world. There was a true sense of changing the world. So the atmosphere was one of youth. It was one of passion. It was one of creativity. It was one of uh, very little structure. Uh, but uh, a process that everybody understood. And you might not codify that process, but you knew it was there. And the process was to get something done and make a difference. And Steve kept using the phrase, give something back. And so there was that really sense of not being part of a company, but being part of a cause, and, or a crusade, or whatever you like to call it.